Okay, everyone. It's 5 p.m. I think we can start the session. I see a lot of people are still joining us today. First and foremost, I'm, I hope you enjoyed Medium Day so far. I viewed some of the presentation. They were remarkable. Uh, my name is Moti Elkheim. I'm the founder of Atlantic Brands, an agency that helps emerging companies with either investor pitching or fractional CMO services. Um, today, we're going to speak about the power of storytelling and why storytelling can really serve us, can really serve us in every aspect of our business, whether it is sales, marketing, recruiting, whatever it may be, we'll see how storytelling can really impact the outcome that we're trying to achieve. Now, throughout this presentation, I'm hoping to achieve two things. One, that you will live with the mindset that getting the business doesn't necessarily mean talking the business or talking the business doesn't necessarily mean getting the business. And the other is that in order to sell, we first need to connect. In order to sell, we first need to connect. And I'm going to show you why storytelling is such a powerful tool to achieve those two things. So let's dive straight to it. Our time is short. We only have 30 minutes. Um, let's talk about storytelling. You know, when I ask people about storytelling and as it became such a big buzzword in the industry, everyone is talking about storytelling. I ask them, why is storytelling so powerful? And then they don't know the answer. Or what are the best techniques of storytelling that you can use in your everyday interactions? And then they don't know the answer to that as well. So as I said, what I'm going to do right now is show you why storytelling is so powerful, but then also give you three storytelling techniques that will allow you to sell better, market better, recruit better, whatever it is that you're trying to do, you'll see how storytelling will allow you to achieve the outcome you want. So let's talk about why storytelling is so powerful. So not too long ago, there was a research that was done in Princeton University. And a researcher there was fascinated with the fact that us human beings are consuming stories and are fascinated and can be grounded for hours by stories, whether it is a book we're reading, a movie we're watching, Netflix. We can binge watch TV shows for hours and not move. What is it about stories that get us so hooked and what they have done in order to understand the power of it is that they took a storyteller and five listeners. They put the storyteller in an fMRI machine that scans the brain activity. And they took the five listeners and put each of them in a single room under an fMRI machine. And they told the storyteller, start telling an emotional story. And when she started telling her story and it became emotional, her amygdala, the part of the brain that is responsible for emotional processing lit up on the screen. At the exact same point in time, all five listeners showed activity on their amygdala in their scanners. When they told the storyteller to transition her story to a logical story that required some data processing, her frontal cortex lit up on the screen. The frontal cortex is the part of the brain that is responsible for logical processing. Can you imagine what happened at the exact same time when her frontal cortex lit up? All five listeners, like firework, simultaneously showing frontal cortex activity in their fMRI machine. And like any other scientific research, they repeated this process to show correlation, to show evidence that there is true connection here. And time after time, after time, after time, when she told the story and her brain showed activity, the listener's brain showed activity in the exact same area of the brain. It became so powerful that they call this phenomenon brain coupling. And what happens is that when we are funneling information into the form of a story, our brain actually has the ability to connect to each other because we are able to understand the context, whether it is logical or emotional better when it's under the envelope of a story. So now we understand why storytelling is so powerful and why people are using storytelling. The question is, 
what kind of stories do we want to tell? And for that, I want to bring in an amazing person called Daniel Kahneman. Daniel Kahneman is a Nobel Prize winner whose discovery, his groundbreaking discovery won in the Nobel Prize. And that discovery was that human beings are not rational decision makers. You heard me right. Human beings are not rational decision makers. In fact, according to Kahneman, who is a behavioral psychologist from the University of Princeton as well, he said that 95%, 95% of the decisions we are making in our lives are emotionally driven. Only 5% are logically driven. Now, let's think about it for a second. 95% are emotionally driven. When we want to leave a job, why is it that we want to leave a job? Because we don't like our boss, we don't like our colleagues, whatever it is. We let a lot of emotions make the decision for us. When we start a company, why are we starting a company? Because we want to follow our dream, we want to follow our passion. What if that is not the emotional thinking? You know, one of the biggest decisions that we're making in our lives, the biggest partnership, is getting married. What if that is what if you know married being married is all about emotional decision making and that happens in business as well. You can hear Jeff Bezos, Mark Cuban, everyone saying that the best decision that they made in business, the best investment that they made in business is when they follow their gut, they follow their heart, and those are all emotionally driven decisions. So we know the power of storytelling, how it can help us connect to the person in front of us. We know that in order to tell a story and a powerful story that will make a person go to action, it needs to be an emotional story because 95% of decisions are made emotionally. And I'm not saying that we should, you know, make the, pro the person in front of us cry or that we should be teary and over exaggerate with our emotional range but it has to have some kind of an emotion capacity and relevancy to the person in front of us so we know that storytelling works emotion drives decision now let's dive into the three storytelling techniques that will allow you to craft your story better and get the outcome that you want and for that i want to ask the audience here and you can comment in the chat who knows what are the three parts to the story? Every story has three parts. Feel free to type them in right now if you know what are the three parts to the story. I'm going to give you a second to do it. Okay, so let's go over it. Experience, someone says experience. What else? The three parts to the story. Well, every story the climax, that's amazing, Bill. Thank you for putting it in. So every story has the beginning, the middle, or the end, exactly. So the beginning, the middle, and the end. And one of the most powerful storytelling techniques, and that it can be, thank you, Don, for saying beginning, middle, and the end, after I said it, <laughs> uh, but I'm glad you got it. The most powerful storytelling technique, and that may sound counterintuitive to you, is to start your story from the middle, the climax, as Bell said. If we want to get people really hooked into what it is that we're trying to sell or deliver, avoid the lengthy introduction, avoid the buildup, go straight to the pitch. And that is a very powerful and famous storytelling technique because it allows you to grab the persons in front of your attention right away. I'll give you an example. I'll give you, um, Donna was just teasing, it's okay. I'll give you an example um, of how to start a story from the middle in a very powerful way. One of the most amazing investor pitch decks that I've seen is by Matchbox. I don't know if many of you heard of the Matchbox. It is actually the largest dating site in the world. It has 14 million people logging into it daily. It's only that today it's called Tinder. But when Tinder started their journey to raise money, their presentation went something like this. They had a picture of a screen of a guy 
And rather than doing a build up and, any, and everything, they had a picture of a guy on the screen and they said, this is Matt. Matt is an amazing guy. He's smart and funny and even attractive. But Matt, like many other, is afraid and he's shy to approach women in a club. How can we allow Matt to show himself and his personality in a way that overcomes his confidence problems? The solution, Tinder. Now you can chat with others and showcase your personality before you even meet them. And the way Tinder did it is actually very powerful because they went straight to the middle. Rather than starting with, look, there is a problem in the dating world and people are not able to approach others. And that is why we developed an app that enables other people to communicate and match online. They went to a real time story that has common sense and commonality to it. And when you're going straight to the point of things, you allow the person in front of you to visualize what it is that you're trying to create. And once we have the ability to visualize, once we started with a story, and it's an emotional story because Matt doesn't have the confidence and we as individuals can relate to Matt, we are already creating a connection with the person in front of us. The brains are now coupling. The story was emotional. And now we can go into the second step of showcasing why our solution is so great. So starting from the middle is a very powerful technique that really captures your audience right from the start. If you recall Saving Private Ryan, when Steven Spielberg started with that Normandy scene, he got everyone really hooked in to the middle of the action right away. And you are being juiced up right from the start. The second storytelling technique that is very powerful was actually discovered by a person named called a person named John Medina. John Medina is a researcher from the University of Michigan and is a neuropsychologist from the University of Michigan. And he said something very powerful. The human brain doesn't have the ability to understand details without understanding the context first. He's calling this meaning over details. If we want someone to really grasp what it is that we are trying to sell, then we have to illustrate the meaning of what we're trying to do. Now, why is that so important? Because a lot of time in today's world, when we're trying to sell a product, when we're trying to market a product, we are feature dumping. We are overloading information on the prospects in front of us. We live in, an era, in a time in this world where people are doing this to find their lifetime partner. The attention span is super, super low. So we cannot load people with information. We have to load them with the meaning first. I'll give you an example of why this uh, technique is so powerful. Let's take one of my favorite companies on the planet today. It's called Gong. I don't know how many of you have heard of Gong. It's a sales intelligence platform. But this is the way Gong is selling their solution to other sales organization. They're going to the VPs of sales and expressing their technology the following way. So assume that you are the VP of sales and I'm selling for Gong. As a VP of sales, you cannot be with every single salesperson at all time. You cannot give them feedback at all time. Imagine having the ability or the technology that will give you feedback on every salesperson performance and data on how to improve them. So it's like a VP of sales multiplier that allows you to be with them at all time. Will that make your team's performance better if you can have that feedback available instantly? What VP of sales wouldn't want to have that solution? Now that I understand the meaning of it, I can go and can dive into the actual details of their solution, how they're capturing data, the analytics, the percentage of time one person talk and the, the percentage of time the prospect talk. But if I would have presented Gong in a way that says, 
look, we have developed a technology that analyzes conversations based on your sales reps and the prospect. We take the amount of time the sales reps talk, the amount of time the prospect talk, we analyze it, we give feedback based on a neurobehavioral technology that reads the text too much. I wouldn't be able to understand any of it. Yes, gong.io, um, answering Birju. The name of the company is gong.io. I wouldn't be able to understand any of that. Feature dumping is killing the context. So when you're trying to sell something, go for the meaning or the pain, as we like to call it in our industry. And then after you explain the meaning, drive the details of your product. And those details will now be in context of what it is that you just discussed. So let's sum up everything that we've discussed so far. The power of storytelling is one, that it creates brain coupling. It allows our brain to really be on the same wavelength, if you've heard this term before. The human brain decision-making process is 95% emotional, 5% logical. So if we're telling a story, it needs to be an emotional story. We want to start our story right from the middle. Let's talk about that gong example again. You as a VP of sales, do you feel the pain of not being able to be next to your sales rep all at the same time? That's a real emotional problem. And then, you know, we go for meaning over details. Don't super dump your features, your product features, and be technical in your conversation. Allow the audience to understand the context first. And the last storytelling technique that I would like to cover with you today is called Wi-Fi. In order to tell a really good story, you need Wi-Fi. Not the Wi-Fi you're thinking of, not W-I-F-I. Wi-Fi as in W-I-I-F-Y. What's in it for you? At the end of the day, when we're trying to communicate something to the prospect in front of us, we need to make it relevant in order for them to see the benefit. And I'll give you an example of how Wi-Fi works very well through a story. So I was on my way once to get a new car, to lease a new car. It was that time of the year. And I don't know why I was always fascinated with Jeep Grand Cherokees. And I told my wife at the time, Tamara, that I want to lease the car. And she said, Moti, but whenever you go to a car dealership, you're always being scammed and you're spending more than what we agreed on. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm always sticking to budget. She goes like, no, you're not sticking to budget. We have three kids. The car is going to be dirty all the time. Get the simplest car that has a gas and brake option. That's all we need to go from places and to stop when we need. I said, fine. I looked at the model I needed. I took my son, Iro, with me. And I don't know if you ever went to car dealerships to lease a car. All the way there, you're just starting to kind of argue with the sales rep you didn't even meet yet on why you want the car and the price you want. Start kind of imagining uh, how you're going to debate that salesperson. So I'm coming into the dealership. I'm looking at the salesperson. I'm telling them, look, this is what I want. This is the price I'm willing to pay. I don't have a lot of time. Let's make it sweet and fast. And he's looking at me and he goes like, Moti, I can see that you've done your research. We're not going to beat around the bush. Let me go get the car key and we'll get, uh, we'll get you out of here in 30 minutes. That never happened to me. He set me at the table. He went, bring the car keys and he's putting them next to the keyboard. And all of it, you know, at all this time, my son Ira is playing in the background with the other cars in the dealership. And then the salesperson starts. And he goes like, Moti, I see that you have a five-year-old son. Did it ever happen to you when you're driving, your, your son is making, your kid is making noise in the back, you're looking for a second, and then when your eyes are back on the road, you realize you almost have an accident and you're emergency braking? I said, yeah, it actually just happened to me on the way here. And he said, I know that because I have kids of my own and there is a solution to that actually. You can add only $60 a month to your lease and your car will come with what we call autonomous braking. So if you have destruction by the kids or whatever it is, the safety feature could save your family's life. And I have it in my car because I don't want to put my kids at risk. 
And I'm thinking to myself, okay, that sounds very reasonable. I spend more than $60 on Starbucks every month. Okay, let's add that $60. Makes sense. And then he's typing in, he's adding the safety feature. And then Ira, my son, all of a sudden pops his head in the car next to us out of the sunroof. And he goes like, and the salesperson goes like, look, Moti, you already added this safety feature. To add the sunroof, I see Ira really loves it. And he's going to watch the snow falling on him in the cold New York winter snow. Why would you add just another $15 to have this, you know, panoramic sunroof? Said, you know what? I already spent 60. Let's add another seven, another 15 to a 75. Okay, let's make it happen. And all of a sudden, I realized that I'm spending more than I should. This guy is Wi Fi me, and I'm the king of Wi Fi. He's using storytelling, emotional storytelling. He's talking about the meaning of the features that he's trying to sell me rather than the actual feature themselves. I see the relevancy. And now I'm spending more money. And then to top it all, it goes like, listen, because you updated all of those features, it's not going to cost you any more money. But just for you to know, the car that you're getting comes with a button that if you push it, the car parks itself. Like, great. That's amazing. Phenomenal. He calculates the price. It's much higher than what I needed. I'm signing the contract. And then I'm realizing he's giving me the same keys the same keys he came with. He knew exactly what he's going to sell me even before he started talking to me. So now I'm on my way back home to my wife and I have a completely different mental argument going into my brain. How am I going to explain her that I spent nearly $100 more a month over a 39 month period at least? That's a lot of money. So I'm kind of planning how I'm going to deliver that argument to her. I'm coming in. I imagine that I'm going to go up to our apartment and tell the story. But before I do so, she calls me. She said, I'm going to meet you downstairs. We're going to Trader Joe's. She gets into the new car. She's seen a lot of flashy buttons. And she goes into this one button and she goes like, I see that you spent more than what we should have. A lot of fancy buttons here. What does this button do? And I said, oh, this is the button that self parks the car. And she goes, why do we need spend, to spend money on a car that parks itself? I told you gas and brake, gas and brake. She was upset because she didn't have any Wi-Fi, didn't have the opportunity to connect to her and tell her the story. And it didn't have any relevancy to her. But the salesperson implemented everything that we spoke about today and sold me a car with features that are great, but I didn't have the intention to buy. And the only reason he was able to do it, <laughs> thank you, Virgil. And the only reason he was able to do it because he used storytelling. He connected with me. It was emotional. He talked to me about my son and emergency braking, saving my family's life. He started from the middle. He showed me the meaning over details. He didn't tell me about how the car could auto, you know, have autonomous braking and it's the latest feature and he's doing that. No. He plugged everything in the form of a story and everything connected. So my suggestion to you next time when you have a proposition to deliver, an argument, a business objective, and you want to connect to the person in front of you, remember the principle of storytelling. And I'm not telling you here to sell stories. I'm telling you to tell stories and you'll be able to sell whatever it is that you need to sell better than ever before. Remember the mindset that we spoke about before. Talking business is not necessarily going to get you the business. And in order to sell, you need to connect first. I hope you enjoyed everything I had to deliver to you today. I'm going to leave some time for Q and A's. I see it in the chat and I see it in the Q and A section. So let me go over it and let's see how we can answer some of those questions. How can we apply this to short and impressional text like product description? So that is a very important question because sometimes when we're sending user manuals, whatever it may be, we need the opening paragraph that really builds the context to it. If you're sending the product description in an email, 
or if it's on a deck, start with an opening paragraph that, that explain why your product was created, not what the product is doing, by why it was created, what kind of pain this product is here to solve. And only then gradually go to the features. We have to put the features in the context of the meaning first. So if you're writing in an email, Chloe, uh, if you're sending it in a deck, then start or whatever it may be, start with a brief understanding, a brief story of why this product is needed. Okay, any other questions? We have a couple more minutes left. I don't see it in the Q&A. Let me go over the chat. And thank you everyone for all the compliments. I appreciate Is Wi-Fi an acronym. Uh, I'm not sure if it's an official acronym. It's a lot of people are using it in sales. Uh, it, st it stands for what's in it for you. And again, the purpose behind it is to understand that when we're coming into a sales pitch, okay, we don't speak about what we do. Leave the I and me out of the conversation. You need to speak in the eyes of the prospect and now you're making their life better. So think of your conversation mindset as what's in it for you. What is go to market? Go to market is a strategy that we are using in order to map out the activities that will allow us to win the market share. For instance, go to market, maybe virtual events, maybe online advertising, maybe guerrilla marketing, on-premise events, whatever it is that is working for your argument. Let me see if we have any other questions here. Okay, it seems like we've covered everything. So again, my name is Moti Elkai. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, or if you wanna email me, I'm at moti at atlanticbrands.co. I'm gonna type my email in the chat here right now. So feel free to be in touch. I'm more than happy to extend the conversation. I hope you enjoyed this session. A few more sessions to go here on Medium. Thank you everyone for your time. I really appreciate it.